It's my distinct pleasure this evening to deliver the State of the Board Address for 2019. As you know, this provides us an opportunity to articulate our shared contemplations regarding the challenges we anticipate facing in the coming year and how we may work together as administrators, trustees, and with our broader school board community to transform those challenges into opportunities for students, staff, and their families. It's also an occasion to speak specifically about some of the particular priorities we have identified in the hope that our stakeholders, those who are truly impacted by the decisions that we make over the coming year, have a concise and intelligible understanding of how we t intend to fulfill our obligations and that they share a certain level of consensus on the direction in which we are all heading. Identifying our challenges and defining those priorities and keeping them both realistic and attainable requires a tremendous amount of vision. It's been said that vision stands on the shoulders of what is actual to get a better view of what is possible. And I believe that the people before you are administrative leaders, those who have continuously worked to refine our strategic directions and system priorities for the coming year possess a collective wisdom that comes with a wealth of experience to provide us with the discernment and foresight we require to address our challenges in a manner befitting of the best interests of our students and staff. I also believe, Mr. Chair, that we have an exceptional new board of trustees, a perfect mix of veteran leadership combined with some new voices who are certain to bring fresh ideas. With the wise counsel I'm certain we will receive from the people around this table, I have great confidence that we will continue to exceed the expectations of those who have trusted us to oversee the education of their children. In order to confront the issues that will test our collective mettle in the coming year, it's important for all of us to understand the broader context in which we operate. Our provincial government is still relatively new, but has already made it abundantly clear that they are committed to finding efficiencies. As with all governing bodies, ours has a finite amount of resources and is under an incredible amount of pressure to fill its, fulfill its obligations and meet the needs of a growing number of interests. Even though education is one of its most important portfolios, we have to anticipate the harsh reality that we may not be able to depend on the same amount of resources to which we have become accustomed. Over the last several years, we have become known as the school board of choice in Windsor-Essex for those students seeking out innovative programs such as our STEM academies, our international baccalaureate programs, and our sports and our skilled trades academies. We have also demonstrated extraordinary leadership and caring for the most vulnerable among us. Those students with challenges and everything that we do and in fully integrating them into our school communities. All the while, our students have continued to exceed provincial academic assessment outcomes, a testament to the growth mindset atmospheres we have all worked together on establishing in our schools. So the challenge then becomes in examining how we can continue to meet the lofty standards we have set for ourselves when faced with the real possibility of having fewer financial resources to deliver the kinds of programs that have distinguished us. All of us will recall that prior to the Christmas break, there was a highly publicized series of memos from the Ministry of Education which called into question the sustainability of a number of EPOs that we have traditionally relied upon to deliver specialized programs. At the time, many critics articulated knee-jerk reactions suggesting that we should expect deep cuts in education funding. However, I can assure you this matter is not so black and white. Although we know that there have been considerable cuts to some of the EPOs, we also anticipate that funding for others will continue. Trustees can expect a future variance report to reflect the nature of these changes. We will continue to analyze their impact working with our provincial counterparts and within our own administrative team on finding ways to minimize any consequences they may have so that we can continue to meet the expectations of our stakeholders. What this really speaks to, Mr. Chair, is being the authors of our own destiny, anticipating potential outcomes and subsequent consequences before they occur, and being prepared to deal with them strategically rather than being, cut off, being caught off guard and beleaguered by them after the fact. This is something we have become very adept at. 
At this point, we have no clear indications of more funding cuts, but our financial department has been continually improving, working with colleagues throughout our system, and finding ways to find efficiencies on our own, and chipping away at our capital deficit without compromising on our commitment to student support and success. In the coming year, our business department will develop a multi-year financial plan that balances the budget with available resources and relies less upon our accumulated surplus while continuing with the implementation of its plan to eliminate the capital deficit. An essential component of our plan, especially when faced with the potential for funding cuts, must be focused on generating new sources of revenue so that we can better support innovative programming for our students. Last year, we approved a new investment policy which we believe will contribute towards the overall financial health and stability of the board and help us better weather any challenges that may come with further funding reductions. Critical to our financial plan is a re-imaging of the way we do business and looking at the ways to maximize the potential of current assets. Facilities like the former St. Anne property in Tecumseh, the new track and field at Holy Names High School, and the soon-to-be-built dome at our Cardinal Carter property in Leamington offers us opportunities to partner with businesses and organizations seeking space, which we believe can play an important role in supporting our local economy and improving the quality of life for the residents of our communities while yielding returns that can support the needs of our students and their families. Of course, maintaining our facilities so that they are in top-notch condition and fully accessible is an important ongoing priority for us. We strive to provide only the best learning environments for our students. So making sure that we are allocating adequate resources to keep our schools in the best order as possible is essential. Speaking of facilities, Mr. Chair, we are aware that some time has elapsed since the original announcement about funding for a new school to replace Catholic Central was made, and we appreciate that some may be getting impatient for shovels to go on the ground. Please know that we've been working diligently resolving all the complexities associated with a major product like building a new school. This is not a simple project and is somewhat complicated by the fact that a new provincial government was elected last fall and that a number of new people have been appointed to various portfolios at, Queen Park, at Queen's Park. Rest assured, knowing that a new Catholic school in central Windsor is a top priority of our list of capital priorities for the coming year and that we will continue to work with our colleagues at the municipal at the municipal level while renewing relationships at the provincial level in order to move the project forward in 2019. Although we believe we are well situated to confront our financial challenges, a major, hur major hurdle we will need to clear this year is in the reality of the contracts for all of our organized labor groups that are due to expire in August of 2019. In the last few years, we have made tremendous strides in our relationships with our employee groups, but with the fiscal constraints being proposed, this could provide for very challenging circumstances for negotiations at both the provincial and the local level. As I mentioned earlier, we have our provincial government clearly committed to finding greater efficiencies that will undoubtedly be confronted with greater demands from labor organizations trying to meet the expectations of their members. Salaries already account for the lion's share of our $260 million operating budget. So how these contracts are negotiated at both the provincial and local level has the potential to add increased budget pressures. However, I remain hopeful that we can reach new agreements that are consistent with the fiscal realities we face, yet still meet the needs of our employees without disruptions to the services we provide. Besides our hope for successful resolution of these contracts, we are also striving to redefine the culture of our school board family so that all of our employees, regardless of their position in organization, feel that they are valued members of our team and that their accomplishments and contributions are recognized and celebrated. Our annual golf tournament at Roseland, our Together in Faith Day at the WFCU Arena, and other community events in which we participate are designed with the sole intent of creating a sense of family while celebrating what truly unites and distinguishes us. It is through creating this culture of togetherness that we believe we can weather whatever uncertainties may lay ahead. And looking beyond the borders of our province, Mr. Chair, we must be ever cognizant of the larger forces at work, including the economic unpredictability on a global scale that could potentially affect us. The possibility of an economic slowdown in China could have dramatic ripple effects 
on world markets and productivity, while new continental trade agreements may impact our own local economy. In his inaugural address late last year, Windsor Mayor Drew Dilkins spoke of the need to prepare for the possibility that Windsor could one day face the same fate that Oshawa did when GM decided to close its assembly plant. He spoke to the necessity of diversifying the economy of Windsor-Essex in order to soften the blow of a sudden loss of a very large employer. And I believe that school boards have a role to play in that diversification as well. Through working with our municipal and post-secondary partners, we can gauge the sectors that are being forecast for future economic growth and development and try to develop complementary programs that will prepare students for the post-secondary pathways that we anticipate will provide them with the greatest opportunities for future success. Some of that is already happening. With the pending construction of one and possibly two new international bridges in our area, as well as the eventual construction of a new mega hospital, our construction academy and trades related programs are preparing students to get a start and in moving into numerous jobs that will be created as a result of these projects. Another promising development for our city was in last year's announcement that Dan Gilbert of Quicken Loans would be locating a new tech support center in the downtown core. At the time, Mr. Gilbert said he had learned a lot about the advantages of Windsor through our two city bid with Detroit to attract Amazon to the region, suggesting that many highly qualified tech specialists with international backgrounds having difficulty entering the US given tighter border restrictions, there was a primary advantage to being located in Windsor. Should this phenomenon continue, there will be a much greater need for highly qualified graduates as the sector expands locally. And we are continually encouraging staff and students to become curators of knowledge and efficiently and effectively communicate responsibly in the digital world. With our STEM academies and our emphasis on promoting cloud-based computing, having coding, robotics, virtual and augmented reality and artificial intelligence embedded throughout our curriculum, we are preparing students for the pathways that will lead them to highly rewarding careers we believe will be created as a result of this further diversification of our local economy. Another trend we must be very aware of is the ever-changing demographics of our community. In recent years, we have seen a significant increase in the number of new Canadians who have arrived here. And while we appreciate the diversity that this phenomenon contributes to the culture of our region. It also does bring some challenges that we have to address. Helping these students with language supports, as well as overcoming the anxieties that often come with suddenly integrating into a new community, can tax resources. However, we welcome the opportunity to assist these people because we believe that as educators, we have an extremely important role to play and help develop these people as they begin their new lives and become contributing members of Canadian society. To that end, we will continue to ensure that our schools create welcoming and inclusive atmospheres where students of all backgrounds can thrive. Adding to the cultural diversification of our schools are our own efforts to attract students here from around the globe. Our international education team continues to recruit students from Asia, Europe, and South America, not only as a way of complementing our enrollment numbers, but also as a way of marketing Windsor-Essex as an academic destination of choice and providing global opportunities for our own domestic students through relationship building. We will continue trying to attract more international students this year, but with an emphasis on ensuring those numbers are both manageable and sustainable. All of these efforts speak to how we are trying to prepare our students for the future, Mr. Chair. However, we are also facing increased pressures to meet the increasing complex needs, especially when it comes to their mental health. Everything from the pervasiveness of technology and increased scrutiny via social media to dramatic changes in gender orientation and easier access to extremely dangerous substances have created a world that continually changes or challenges the mental stability of our students. We will continue to work to support their mental health and well-being through promotion, prevention and intervention strategies in cooperation with their families and our community partners. Of course, one of these essential supports that we can provide for our students, Mr. Chair, is what truly distinguishes our board, our faith. Our Catholic faith and values are what gives us a unique sense of purpose, and we will continue to seek out new ways to cultivate a holistic environment that focuses on the academic and spiritual growth of both staff and students 
by celebrating service to community through faith development programs such as our Journey to Holiness and Staff Faith Formation Opportunities. And while we celebrate our Catholic faith and support we, we receive from a government that believes in the value of Catholic education, we will continue to enhance inclusionary practices so that all students feel safe and welcome in our schools while supporting opportunities for our students and staff to put their faith into action by engaging in diverse programming and social justice experiences. It is in the service of others that we often feel most fulfilled and through following the example of Jesus, putting our faith into action while providing meaningful, meaningful and ongoing Catholic faith formation for all students and employees, we believe that through working in cooperation with our parish and our diocesan partners, we can create a collective sense of purpose, build resilience, and help improve the mental health and well-being of our students and staff. Of course, we may never forget the core part of our mission, empowering our students with the knowledge and skills they need to live purposeful, meaningful lives. In order to do that, we must continually examine the methods we employ to help our students meet the curriculum expectations that have been set for them. To that end, Mr. Chair, we will continue to monitor our EQAO assessment results, our graduation rates, and other important cohort data to ensure that all students are meeting expected outcomes as they progress through their grade levels and that we are providing our teachers with the support they need to ensure that their pupils, their pupils succeed. In the area of mathematics, we will continue to focus on fundamental concepts and skills in order to create deeper understanding through solving while building content knowledge of mathematical concepts with staff, specifically in the areas of number sense, patterning, patterning, and algebra. We will also continue to facilitate cross-panel conversations with grades seven, eight, and nine teachers in both literacy and numeracy in order to ensure that our students are making smooth transition from elementary to secondary schools. We will continue to expand learning opportunities for students with special learning needs through structured learning with the support of technology embedded in literacy and numeracy programs and expansion of work-related opportunities and training. What this really speaks to, Mr. Chair, is the total team approach towards setting all of our students up for success so that they can achieve to their highest capabilities and fulfill their potential. As we face the challenges that lie ahead, one area of concern which we have identified as a major priority is in building capacity within our own system. As some members of our administration, both senior roles and at the school level, prepare for retirement, we must ensure that we are preparing a new generation of leaders who can move seamlessly into those positions in order to maintain the positive momentum we have created. To that end, we are embracing a new leadership paradigm which we believe will foster a corporate culture in which our employees feel confident to step forward and fulfill their potential, leading to a greater sense of self-efficacy and fulfillment amongst our staff. An essential part of that involves working directly with our employee groups to better understand their needs. By way of example, we are currently working with the Windsor-Essex chapter of the Catholic Principals Council of Ontario to better understand what they require to succeed and will develop programming that will not only make them better principals, but also prepare them to move into a pool of available talent that will eventually assume more senior administrative roles. We have some of those individuals in our audience tonight. We will bring forward a report to trustees in the future that will outline how we intend to meet the professional development and leadership needs of our staff. In conclusion, Mr. Chair, I would like to point out that before you this evening are our strategic directions and priorities, which will provide more detailed and specific information on how we plan to achieve some of the goals I've spoken to this evening. I would also like to point out that another priority for the coming year is the development of a new multi-year strategic plan which will help, set up, help us set up new priorities for the years ahead and reimagine new ways to achieve them. Thank you, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions from trustees at this time.